Hello, and welcome to Troubleshooting with the Arduino and the PicoScope. Here we're going to look at the circuit on a prototyping board connected to the Arduino. And the Arduino has a connection to our computer through this USB port. It can also be powered through this barrel jack. And actually there's a VIN pin that we're going to use in the robotics. And on this side are the digital IO. Over here are some of the power, some of the pulse width modulated signal over there as well, and an analog input to A0. So on this proto board, what we have are a few different devices that we'll be using. We've got an LED connected to a 470 ohm current limiting resistor. Same thing here, but a green LED. And here we have a normally open push button circuit uh, connected on one side to ground and on the other side, which goes to the prototype or to the Arduino, is a 4.7K pull up resistor. The next thing that we have here is a three terminal variable resistor. You can use a 10K or a 5K. One side is connected to the positive, the other side is connected to ground. And as you turn it clockwise, make sure that the voltage is increasing. We also have two wires connecting ground, ground and plus five to our board. We have some connections to the oscilloscope, this yellow and violet wire, and these two are ground connections to the oscilloscope. And uh, back over here at the low pass filter, this is a polarized capacitor. So make sure the negative side is going to ground, the positive side to our circuit. And we have two channels on the oscilloscope measuring the pulse width modulated signal at this point and the filtered DC signal at this point. And as we increase the time high on the pulse width modulated signal, it should cause the DC voltage to increase up to a maximum of whatever your DC voltage is. And that's one thing I would like you to do in the lab is to measure that voltage with respect to ground because we're assuming it's five volts in a lot of our calculations, but it's not. It's probably going to be 4.6, 4.7, maybe 4.8, but it's not always five volts. It depends on the device that's that you're connected to, for example, your laptop. Make sure over here too, this is the uh, probe. The tip is where we connect the signal to. There is a ground wire that we have to connect to our circuit. But another important thing is the switch. This switch is on the probe to help reduce the loading of the probe to the circuit. So we don't want to have the probe influence or change the voltage in our circuit. So to prevent that, there is a switch here that you can set for times 10 and it reduces that loading. You also have to set up the software to tell the software we're using times 10. So make sure that switch is set to times 10. So have a look at this circuit, double check that you've wired it correctly, uh, do a little bit of troubleshooting if it doesn't work, but this is what we're gonna be using for lab number one. We're going to start off by looking at some of the basics of the oscilloscope. And that is the horizontal and vertical settings. To start with, we'll look at the vertical settings. That means the settings from top to bottom. And on channel A, we've set it to plus and minus 10 volts. So that means at the top we have plus 10 and there are 10 divisions. So down at the bottom is minus 10. That's a total of 20 volts. So that makes each division two volts per division. You see that here six volts and then eight volts. If I change it to five volts per division, well, uh, or sorry, plus and minus five, that's 10 volts from top to bottom. So each division is now worth one volt, but let's move it back up here. The other thing that you have to do is set the scope probe setting. And you do that by clicking on, or uh, double clicking on this box until you get to probes and then, I think the newer version is a little bit easier because it's got times 10 probe. So that's all you have to make sure. Same thing for this box, go to probes, make sure it's times 10. It has to match what you've set on the actual physical probes as well. One of the other places that you'll want to go to is more. And there is a button called settings. 
And here's just a few things to consider. Uh, make sure this is set to last session. What that will do is if you've set up the scope in a certain way, you shut down and restart, it'll come back that way. The other thing you want to maybe change is light and dark settings. I prefer light, but a lot of students prefer dark. You can also change the thickness of the lines, but I think one is the best here. And whether the side panel is on the left or the right, but again, I prefer it to be on the left-hand side. And default settings, none of that's very important. So to get away from that menu, just click more again and more to get back to the original screen. The other place you'll want to go to is to save. So if you click on save, and there is something called um, PS settings right here. So what you want to do is give this a name, and that's not a very good name. I think that's just the, the date. And you can say maybe two channels and then times 10. So you can remember that you've used times 10 with two channels and then you save that. And so if you ever have to come back and use that again, you can just go to open and it'll show you two times that channel. And I, I have many other ones from different settings I've done for other courses. So we'll come back out of that. Um, this stops, so you have to restart it. So those are just a couple of kind of uh, pre-setting things that you should be able to do. Let's start off by looking at, at how you set the vertical settings. You'd first come over to this panel and a quick and easy way to do it is just press minus to move to the next level and plus to move to that level. Or a different way to do it is just click anywhere in the center and then you can switch it to plus and minus one, two, five, 10, 20, whatever you would like to choose. Okay. Uh, in most cases, I think plus and minus 10 is a good setting for most of what we do with uh, the Arduino. Channel B, the same sort of thing. You can click on that center area and change it to plus and minus 20 perhaps, but again, probably plus and minus 10 will work. Okay, so that's called the vertical settings. And as I had mentioned, it's important to note here that for example, in channel A, it's set to plus and minus 10. So at the top is plus 10, at the bottom is minus 10, and, that, and there are 10 divisions from top to bottom. So 20 volts divided by 10 divisions is two volts per division. If we switch to five, that's going to make it one volt per division. So be aware of how to do those calculations. The next setting is up here, and that's called the horizontal. I'm just going to close that down. The horizontal represents the time per division. Okay, How much time each of these divisions represents. Right now it's set for two milliseconds, but a simple and easy way is just to click on these buttons. And now it sets it to 10 milli per division or maybe one. And you don't want to have it looking something like this. That's too short a time. And then if you go too much this way, it makes it hard to read and it makes it hard for the scope to do its calculations. So in this case, a good setting might be one or two milliseconds per division. You can choose it by selecting the plus and minus, or you can come down here and selecting two milliseconds, five milliseconds, whatever you might want to choose. So there are different ways of doing that. So looking at this screen, it's telling me it's two milliseconds per division. So the time from this division to the next division represents two milliseconds worth of time. So this, this is about a two millisecond period. And I can go to one millisecond and you'll see from here to here, it's two milliseconds. So time high is about one, time low is about one. Not exactly though, okay, but very close. We'll look at measurements uh, very soon. Another setting you wanna become familiar with is triggering. So right now, this is the triggering panel. I can click on it and it gives you some options here. Modes, type, the source, where it's coming from, the pre-trigger, the threshold, and the direction of the trigger. So let's explain some of these. First of all, the trigger, the one you're probably going to use most often is auto. 
Anytime you have a repeating signal, such as this one, you'll want to use auto trigger. There are times though, for example, if you don't know the expected signal, you don't know how it's going to trigger, you might want to select none. This is also very useful for DC voltages, okay, selecting none. And I'm doing it to channel A, you can see that down here. But when I don't trigger, the signal is going to move to the left, to the right, whereas if I click on auto trigger, it does trigger, it's stable, makes it easier to read. There are instances where you will want to use single trigger, and every time you do that, it'll trigger once, and then you have to restart the scope, and then it'll trigger again. Every time you want to recapture, you have to hit that button that says stopped, but we'll leave it in auto for now and start it again. The other thing is trigger level, okay? And uh, trigger level, the name that they use here is threshold, and that's this little yellow diamond shaped uh, signal right here. Right now it's set to a one volt threshold. I can go to two volts and that puts it in the center. And in general, you want to have that trigger signal somewhere in between the lower level and the upper level. Somewhere in that uh, middle one third. Don't go too low, don't go too high because any kind of noise will trigger the signal as well. Okay, so two volts is probably good for a TTL signal. The other thing that you want to select is direction. In this case, the trigger level is, is being triggered on a rising edge. If I want to trigger it on a falling edge, now it triggers on a, a falling edge. The, one of the things that can be quite confusing is this pre-trigger. If I put it right in the center, which is 50%, okay, uh, just took a little bit of time to refresh, but right now it's right in the center, okay, at 50%. That's fine for many situations, but I tend to put it at the 20% point. Okay, and on the screen, this would be 0%, 10%, 20, 30, 40, and 50. The reason I prefer to use 20% is that you get to look at what happens after that trigger point. But sometimes you might wanna know what happened before, but 20, 30% is a good setting. So rising edge, falling edge, threshold, okay, two volts, check for that yellow icon on the screen. My source is channel A, the blue one. And uh, simple edge is what we're going to use most of the time, but there's a lot of different types that for more complex triggering, you may want to choose a different one. But for simple edge, that's fine. And uh, maybe later on, we'll take a look at uh, some of the other settings, but none, very useful for DC, and auto, very useful for signals that are changing all the time. And uh, you'll see most of the common settings up on the screen as well. Okay, so I've turned that off. Another thing that you'll quite often want to do is uh, move where the zero point is. And so you can see here, I have to go to the left-hand side to move where the zero is for channel A. And you also want to make sure that it's lined up on one of the graticule lines, okay? These lines going across here. Same thing for the B channel, but now you've got to come over here and probably want to click on where the zero is. And you can see the arrow changes. And let's say I want my zero to be right there. I trigger on that. And that way I know, for example, I'm seeing this red line, it's at about two point something volts. And this blue line up here, it's just about uh, five, but it's not quite five, but it's close to five. We're gonna look at different ways of measuring those signals. Okay, so again, you wanna shift that up or down, do it here for the A channel, over here for the B channel, in between the signal and where the numerical values are. You can also use these cursors, which are located up here. So if I wanted to know what that top peak was, um, sorry, that's on the, the red side, so I'm gonna leave that up there. So let's say I wanna know the top peak for channel A, the blue channel, it's about 4.65. For the B channel, let's see what that voltage is sitting at, 2.37. Okay, you can also do it for the horizontal. There are places down here where it's sitting, 
So if I wanted to know the period of that signal, I would line it up here. And there's a second one. I would line that here, and that would give me the period of the signal. And it's telling me the period, the difference between the number one cursor and the number two cursor is 2.05 or 06 milliseconds, which is a frequency of about 490 hertz, which makes sense for the pulse with modulated, pulse with modulated signal on the Arduino. So all of these things are making sense. If you want to turn off the cursors, I think you can just click on this and you'll get rid of all of them. An even better way to measure signals is to use the automatic measurements. And that's found with this tool here. Uh, and as an example, let's say I wanted to know the frequency on channel A. So, and you wanna have between maybe three and seven cycles on the screen too many or too few, and it may not measure correctly. So I would select this to measure frequency. And um, you'll get a, a menu over here. And if you don't want to use pass failure limits, these are actually uh, new from this version. And let's go, just go back to measurements, frequency. And I want to do it on A. And I don't need to do that. I want to do it on the whole trace. So that's all you have to select. And then um, I think you can just close this off and it's measuring. No, I don't want to delete. I think what happened is I just am not seeing everything at the bottom of the screen, but I probably can shift that up here. So yes, now I'm seeing the frequency. I'm going to turn that off. Let's say I wanted to know the peak value of channel A, or the top value, which is this one here. I um, just say top of channel A, and I can just turn that off. Or the measurement of the top of channel A, we come over to measurements, and I'm going to delete it first. So we find top. Okay, and the top is measuring this top signal right here, the voltage on the top signal. Once you have all these things set, so channel A, the whole trace, we don't wanna have any limits. So you just click anywhere on the screen and you get these measurements. Now, one of the other things that can be helpful is to get some statistics. So if I want to see the statistics, if I do want to see the statistics, what I would do is come over here and see how there's small, medium, and large. I either use small or medium, but the medium gives you a little bit of a benefit because it shows you some statistics, like what was the maximum frequency, what was the minimum frequency, what was the average frequency, and those are the most common. And you can also reset it. Okay, so it's showing you minimum, maximum, and even here, it shows you what the minimum and maximum uh, level for the top of channel A is. Some of the other measurements you might wanna have is let's say I wanted to know the top value of channel B. So I'd come over to measurements and I'd select B, make sure that I'm highlighting top, and it's showing me the top voltage for B. So let's just see that, it colors it in red, and it says it's 2.4 volts. And I can always reset the statistics, so it's, it's not changing very much, it's an average of about 2.44. And if I wanted to see it using the cursor, so I can just bring my cursor down, and uh, if I wanna get the average, I probably need to put it somewhere in the middle. So I'm getting about 2.4 here, and about 2.4 there. So it tells me it's quite accurate. If I wanna do the same thing for channel A, bring this down and I'm getting about 2.4 or 4.67. And if I look down here, that's about what I'm getting. Okay, so all those things are working out. Now we're going to look at the Arduino code for lab number one. Let's start off by looking at Device Manager. And you do this by going to Search Device Manager in Windows and eventually scroll down to the point where it's showing you ports, uh, specifically COM ports. 
And it should show if your Arduino is connected, it should show Arduino Mega 2560, in this case, connected to COM8. Make sure that you test that first if you're having any kind of uh, problems connecting. We'll close this window. The next tool to go to is go up to Tools and Board and make sure your board is the Arduino Mega or Mega 2560. And the second thing you want to check is the port that's listed here agrees with the serial port you have here and it also agrees with what you had in Device Manager. Those are two places you want to check um, if it doesn't seem to connect. Another place you'll go to once in a while is a file and under here maybe preferences and you can change the size of the font. Let's say I wanted to go down to 12 and you can also change the size of the interface, which is the serial output. I'm going to make it a little bit smaller. Once you've made those changes, go back to OK. And actually for the demo, I'm going to leave it a little bit bigger. So I'm going to go back to preferences and bring this up to 14. Let's start off by understanding what these buttons are up here. This is to verify the program and I'll try that right now. If you don't have any kind of syntax errors, uh, it will just keep running. And this is to upload your program. And what upload means is to take the code that you have on this machine, compile it, create the machine code, and program that into the memory of the Arduino. So I'm going to try that right now. It's going to give you a little bit of output information. It's going to tell you that it's uploading. And then it actually goes back into that serial mode to show you what's happening. Okay, if you have a syntax error, and let's just try one of these. So let's say you spelled this word with two N's, and then you tried to uh, verify it first. It tells you that there's an error, and it's telling you where the error is located. And it seems to be that it's located on a different line that you might expect. It's actually saying, it's on line 34, position number 32 in that line. So we're going to go all the way to 34. Okay, and I think the reason it gives you that error the first time here is because it's trying to declare that variable up here. It didn't work out, so you see that error down here. So one of the things to note here is that not every time the error that's on a particular line is what you'll see down here. And it also tells you that uh, C-O-N-N -N doesn't name a, a type. So that's a bit of a, a hint right there. So let's fix that. So that's called a, a syntax error. Let's try another one. Um, for example, right here, I'm going to put two T's in right. And we'll try to compile that. And it's telling you there is an error on line 22 and it's in column number three. Okay, so I think that's just where it's beginning. So I'll fix that error. We'll compile again. And you don't get any errors. One of the other things I'll do is I'm gonna disconnect my Arduino and I'm going to try to upload my code and I get this error, okay? That's an indication that it doesn't see that particular hardware. So if you ever get that kind of timeout error, try plugging the Arduino back in. Okay, and then download again, or transfer the program, uploading. Sometimes I'll say downloading because that's what you do on the PLC. The names can be kind of confusing. So everything worked out okay there. So here are the file names, okay? And you can't have any spaces in the file name. And the extension is .ino, and that's from the word Arduino, okay, the last part of Arduino. Always have a title, your name, and maybe a program description. These two slanted lines here indicate a comment. And so the first lines here from three to five are just telling the compiler that green LED is going to be equivalent to six, red LED to seven, push button one to three. Same thing for this one. And uh, what I had to do on line number eight is I measured the supply voltage with a multimeter. 
because I do want to get accurate answers. And the best way to do that is to measure the supply. And I wrote down the value to this variable, which is a floating point variable. Now that I've done that section, I come down to this void setup, which is the another function that must be in the Arduino code. And this area from here down to here are all items that I would need to set up or configure the program that I'm going to be using. So the first one is on line 12 called serial begin 9600. I'm just telling the system that I'm going to be transmitting data at 9600 bits per second. So you must have that there anytime you want to use the serial monitor. Now line 15, uh, 16 and 18 are all used to tell the Arduino which mode the pin is going to operate in. By default, it's input. If you want it to be an output, you must program it to be an output. That's why I've done that here. So I've used the label green LED uh, as one of my outputs. Red LED is another output. Push button one is an input and pin 13 as an output. And then on line 20 to 22, what I've done there is I'm telling pin 13 to go to a logic high, which is actually a pin on the board. Wait for 250 milliseconds or a quarter of a second and then change it to a logic low. So it'll go off. Line 25 down to 43 is the main section of code. So let's run through this a little bit. So the looping part of the program is the part that just keeps repeating over and over again. And on line 27, I'm telling the system to read the analog input, and this is connected to the variable resistor, and uh, send it to a variable called A0 integer. And it's reading uh, a 10-bit A to D converter and converting the value from 0 to 1023. It's going to have a resolution of 4.9 millivolts. And to figure out the resolution, you're taking the 5 volts, dividing it by uh, 2 to the 10, which is uh, 1024. Now, once I've done that, I'm going to convert it to a, a voltage in, so a voltage value. And I do that by taking the integer value, dividing it by 1023, and multiplying it by the measured supply voltage, which in this case was the, I believe, 4.76. Once I've done that, I want to create a pulse width modulated value. Pulse width modulation has a range of 0 to 255 and 128 is approximately in the middle so that would give you a 50% duty cycle. So it's going to give you a value between 0 and 100% duty cycle for 0 to 255. But what I'm doing is using a map command and the map command will take an input range and associate it to an output range. So if the input is 0, output 0. If the input's 1023, the output is 255. If the input is halfway, 512 for example, the output will be halfway or about 128. Okay, And then once I've done that, I'm going to convert it to a percent pulse width modulation. But the actual instruction that writes the pulse width modulated value is a value between 0 and 255. So uh, all this is doing here is testing a push button and if it's true or false, turning on a green LED. And then this is where we do the actual pulse width modulation out. It's called analog write. It's going to pin two and whatever value between zero to 255, it will produce a pulse width modulated signal somewhere in the range of zero to 100%. The next lines from 38 to 41, all they do is test for uh, percent pulse width modulated value greater than 50. If it is, turns on the red LED. If it's not, it turns off the red LED, just does one of the two. Now the next part of the code from line 45 down to 54 is just used to output to the serial monitor. So it's going to display the integer value from A0, the voltage it produced, whether the push button is pressed or released, 
the pulse width modulation value and the percent pulse width modulation from zero to 100%. Okay, so to download that or to upload it, sorry, in this case, you just click on that upload button and uh, all of your conditions will be shown down here. It's done uploading. So now we click on this button up here, which is the serial monitor. Okay. And now it's going to give us all of our values. So A0 integer is 521. VIN is 2.43. Push button is not pressed. I'm going to actually press it on the board, which I just did. That caused it to go high. Pulse width modulation, a value between 0 and 255 equals 130. That's about halfway. Okay, so it's 50%. If I adjust the variable resistor, so I'm doing that manually on the board now, I'm getting up to 710, pulse width modulation of 176, and percent pulse width modulation is 70%. And I can go all the way up as well. Percent. And I'm going to adjust the variable resistor on my board until I see 20% on the pulse width modulated percentage. Okay, that's giving me an analog integer value of 209, a voltage of one volt, pulse width modulated value of 52 out of 255, and that should be 20%. We'll go over the calculations in the video. So now I'm going to move it to 50%. Okay, we're at about 50 if I adjust the variable resistor. And you can see that the voltage is about 2.3 volts at my output as well. And then I'm going to go to 80%. And there's about 80, and I'm getting a voltage of about 3.8 volts. So um, what's happening here is, and the main part of the program that you need to look at is right here in this section of code. When it's reading the analog input, converting it to a voltage, and then converting it to a mapped value, in the pulse width modulation variable, and then as a percentage, and then eventually it's analog writing to pin two. And we'll try to do those calculations within the video. So let's move on to the video section.